I would love to say good afternoon to CEO. <laughs> Leave. Yeah, don't miss that part. Yeah, how's, how's it going, sir? How's it going? Really good, man. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me, man. Big fan of your channel and love what you guys are doing. Thank you. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, historically, you know, what we're going to do in this interview is that we're going to let people understand, one, your journey, the history of your company, which is, which is phenomenal. Um, what you've been able to put into the actual music industry as a foundation, um, especially for Urban Acts as well, is something that I think is somewhat unrivaled. And I think within, within the interview process, we'll be able to get to that. So let's start from the beginning. You used to be a musician yourself. Yeah, I was a, I guess I was a rapper before it was called Urban. It was just... Um, you were rapping? Kind of. Yeah. It was, I was doing a lot of things back then. It's 2005. I was just... <laughs> I guess <clears throat> my brother and I were in the same band, you know. Um, we signed to a management deal with Albert Samuels and we kind of... I loved everything about the music Sorry, industry. Sorry, Albert Samuels? Did he manage So Solid as well? Yeah. Ah. But okay. I was nowhere near as cool as So Solid okay. back at the time. Yeah. I loved making music. I loved every part of that process until I got into the business side of it. And then it just became a nightmare for me because you had... You were waiting on people all the time. Everything was kind of nearly happening. It wasn't. You were told when you were releasing something. And then we never did release anything. We spent, you know, all these kind of years of our life putting every effort we had into the music. And then the day our single was supposed to come out, the whole thing just got scrapped. And then I moved back to Birmingham with my brother. We were in a little council flat. And we just never had another phone call off my manager. And fair play to him. I don't blame him because I was a nightmare at that time. Like, this is not a reflection of him. He, he did a really good job. But... <clears throat> we went back and that was the end of it. We were just cast out of the industry and that was the end. But then we looked at it and it was like, I've got some people here that want to buy my song. Now, how can I get them to buy my song? And that was the whole premise of it. So we went down to HMV. <clears throat> it was Christmas time and it was really busy like because the X Factor single had just come out. And we were like, we want to put our CD in a shop. And this woman just started like, not really laughing, but it was like, she was just kind of like, you know, look around you, this, you know, every, this is so full, I'm not going to put your little CD in this shop. So he said, okay, well, who, what label are you guys with? And we're like, oh, we've not got one. So I went home, me and Matt started a record label, it took six months to get all the paperwork done. We had to phone up, I can't remember who it was, it was like the PPL or someone, and they had to do all this stuff. They had to have a meeting once a month to, to, say the, to approve each record label. Six months later, we went back to HMV. I said, look, I've got a record label now. And she said, okay, well, who's your distribution deal with? Because you need that to get into HMV. So like, why didn't you tell me that six months ago <laughs> for a start? You just wasted six months. And then it was clear at that point, <clears throat> sorry, it was clear at that point, without a record deal, without a CD, you're never even getting on the radio, let alone into the charts. Because if you don't have a record deal, then you can't put something, it's someone to buy. And if you haven't got it to buy, then you can't promote it and you won't get on the radio. And I looked around all my friends and they were making music and we all had no outlet to distribute our music or do anything with it. So my brother and I started trying to release our own music. We eventually set everything up as a company to put our own song out. We got to like number 75 or something. And then we went back to this little council flat. I was window cleaning. My brother had a little computer repair company that was called <laughs> Ditto. When we came up with the idea of Ditto, the first thoughts we had, because my expectations were so low at that point, I'd never seen anyone from my area run a huge business. I'd never really been out of the country much. I'd never seen anything into the music industry. When I first went into a music industry office that had a plaque on the wall, it's like, you know, I couldn't believe it. This is the music industry. And I think that's how a lot of musicians feel or used to feel when they get into it, that it's this kind of thing so far away from them. And it was for me, because I was in a council flat in Smethwick. So we came up with this idea. <clears throat> we'll get all of our friends. They can pay us like 15 pounds and I'll put their music on to into shops. So we went to the shops, none of them were interested. And then we got one deal with a company called Whip It, and they were like the first distribution store. They eventually, their investors eventually went on to start Spotify, like a few years later, like a, a few of their group. And then we set up this company called Ditto. And I said, the reason we're called Ditto is because my brother was fixing people's computers from, from our living room. When I did my window cleaning, I had to call my window cleaning Ditto because when people phoned up, I didn't know if they'd want a computer or their windows cleaned. Then we were doing, I was renting bouncy castles out. So I bought a bouncy castle, my window cleaning money. And then 
that was called ditto bouncy castles because when people phoned up i needed to know if they wanted their windows cleaned a bouncy castle or the um or the computers so when we started ditto we would have called it something terrible like we had all these ideas like get a number one.com you know all these terrible stuff the only reason we called it ditto is because the first two years we were doing all these jobs and every time someone phoned up we'd have to say hello ditto and then work out if they wanted the music or the <clears throat> the window cleaning so we at the time when we started ditto as i said we were working from our bedroom we weren't really getting anywhere in the music industry. We were getting, I got an email off someone at a record label that said, you know, this might make a nice Christmas present, but this is never going to work long term as a business. No one really took us seriously. We didn't have a market budget for anyone to take us seriously. So we started looking at what we could do. So a year before our single didn't chart. So we looked at it, okay, let's go for that week again and find a band that we can try and get into the top 40. We found an artist. We then worked out to, um, that we could put them on pre-release for three months, which means all the sales during that three months would count towards the first week of sales, which people do a lot now, but no one was doing it back then. A lot of the stuff people do now every day is stuff kind of, even just getting on iTunes, people take for granted because you couldn't do it back then if you were unsigned. So we sent them on tour. They were like an indie band. They were kind of, you know, grabbing all these pre-sales. Then we worked out this thing with mobile phones. You could buy a SIM card off the internet for three pounds that had five pounds worth of credit on it. Now, every time you downloaded a song, it cost you £1.50 and you got £1 back profit. So you could download three songs for £4.50 from a £5 SIM card that you paid £3 for and get £3 back. So it actually didn't cost you anything to download songs. So my brother and myself, my mum, were all sitting in this flat downloading these songs off these boxes of SIM cards that we had. All these Vodafone SIM cards, man. Um, and then in the second week of January, the song came out and I got a phone call at eight o'clock in the morning on the Monday. And I remember waking up thinking it was about a bouncy castle <laughs> because it was the weekend. And then someone was like, hey, uh, this is the charts company. Is this Ditto? And me and my brother thought at the time we were probably going to go to prison or something because we cheated that badly, you know. And I remember my brother looking out of the window as if the police were there, like something ridiculous. But we, like I said to us, the music industry was so far away. Um, and then they said, okay, who's this band Cooper? And I was saying, well, I guess, you know, we've just released them through Ditto. And they said, oh, you've got a song at number 12 in the charts. And then I just looked at my brother, I was like, yes. <laughs> all of that stuff of two years of window cleaning and doing all this, these jobs at that point had paid off, you know. Um, and then, man, I woke up the next day and we had, we were, we were using PayPal at the time, you know, for all our payments. And we still do, but it literally went from having one customer a month. I woke up and it was just like, ching, 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 ching. And this story exploded everywhere, all over the world. We had like um, Radio 1, it was on Radio 1, BBC came in and were doing documentaries and they all got it completely wrong of what they were. <laughs> the guy came in with a USB stick and it's still on the internet. He goes, this is an MP3 player. These guys in Birmingham have created this. It's like, oh, whatever, just, I don't care. Just put me on the TV. <laughs> and then... It happened that week, they changed the rules so you didn't need a CD in the charts. And I didn't even know this at the time because wow. we were going to do CDs, but we didn't have the money. So Radio 1, breaking news story, first ever unsigned man in the top 40 without a CD. And then we had loads of press from it. And then suddenly we had 10 top 40s in the first 12 months, 10 top 40s with unsigned bands no one had heard of, using the same model until they banned us using SIM cards. But at the time <laughs> we, had, we had a good run. <laughs> but... We were getting all these new bands into the charts and then suddenly all the industry was it was imploding because it was 2007 and iTunes had come in, Napster had disappeared and then people were phoning us up that would never have phoned us up before. We moved into an office and then we kind of didn't really know where we were because it's not like starting a bakery and thinking, right, okay, we're going to bake bread and that's the business plan. It's like, I'm doing something no one's doing here. And bands were phoning us up literally and saying, you know, how much for a top 40 single? I was like, guys, I can't promise you anything. We'll give you 20,000 pounds. That's exactly how much it is. So white people were just throwing money at us and we kept getting these top 40s. But then after 12 months, it was like, man, this isn't the model, just putting people into the charts because they're disappearing after a week. Mm. The first band it happened to, it went well. They got a record deal with someone bigger, blah, blah, blah. But after 12 months of it, it was like, man, this isn't, this isn't really the way forward. We're creating a lot of stuff here, but it's very short term. So what myself and my brother always wanted 
was the tools I didn't have when I was a musician, which was, I couldn't release a song. I literally went to a record label down the road and they said, look, I'll give you 500 pounds if you just put my song in HMV under your name. And they were like, well, that doesn't really fit with our record label. Well, they're, they're out of business now. <laughs> and so were HMV, by the way. <laughs> No one listened to what I was doing for the whole 12 months. No one, no major label phoned me up in 2007 and said, guys, what you're doing is brilliant. This is the future of the music industry. When people say, what is the difference between Ditto Music and a record label? That's my foundation for building my business. Do you know how record labels started? The first record label. The first record label was, I think, um, Capital or Parlophone. It was a furniture shop. It was a furniture shop in America and they were selling cabinets and they were like, well, no one's buying these cabinets. How can we get rid of these cabinets? Let's put there's like a gramophone in there. All right, we need some music. At that time, people were only selling sheet music. There was no recorded yeah, yeah. music. Sheet music was the biggest seller. Hire a studio, get them to play something, put it in the gramophone, put it in the cabinet, it's out of there. And that became, I I'll have to double check which one it was, but it, it's like one of the biggest record labels. That's how the whole thing started. These people didn't come in to think, hold on, that guy's playing music, let's help him reach an audience and make money. It was like, I wanna sell a cabinet, I wanna own this, do that, do this. So when I see people come into this industry and say that they're an indie label now, because you know Warner, Universal, all these guys have offshoots based on the model I did, by the way, 12 years ago. Is that, would that be like Sony Red, ADA, Sony Red, Caroline? Maybe not so much Sony Red because they, they've, I mean, they bought The Orchard, which were a similar company to us, mm -hmm. and then did the same thing. Ditto, at the time, when we, when we went back, we were 100% royalties, and that was, all about, that was always our model. We will give you 100% back, and you just do subscription. But what happened, was happening to us was people like Sam Smith and Ed Sheeran and all these Royal Blood, huge acts were coming through, Stormzy, and they were selling, you know, Stormzy must have done a million sales through Ditto, you know, huge amounts, but he was on a subscription, and that's not Storms' fault, anyone's fault, well, that was my model at the time. So then it was like, well, he's going somewhere else and they're giving him something. What are they actually giving him? Explain to me, Lee, what, what is the Ditto business model and how has it developed in recent years? So originally, when we started Ditto, it was 100% to the artist, we take nothing but do your admin. Now, it doesn't sound like much now because everyone does it, but you've got to understand back then, and what I was saying about the, you know, before about furniture shops, record labels are built on a model that gives an artist back 9% of their own money that takes their masters for life. Prince doesn't own Purple Rain. The Beatles don't own any of their catalog. How crazy is that? That, you know, you can write some of the greatest songs and then that gets sold to Michael Jackson and you don't have any say in it at all. That was the model and that model is ridiculous, but that happened for 50 years because record labels could do it. So when the labels come through now, and say, well, you know, we, we believe in artists. No, you don't. You're doing this now because you have to do it. Because I've come along, and companies like myself have come along and actually given artists a choice of leaving you. And if you don't give them that, they won't be back. So if you could still be doing 9% royalties, and then, apart from the 9% royalties, you've got to understand, an artist gets your video taken out. If the boss of your label goes for dinner, that's off you. So really, find me one artist in the 90s who has any money, who had a number one song. None, because they're not earning money every day from their songs. Look at the De La Soul thing at the moment. Yeah, mate, 10%. Tommy, Tommy Boy's trying to give them the 10% royalty because they don't own that. They don't even have a say in their own records. Mm -hmm. And it's because back then, the same position I was in in 2006, if you want to get on the radio, you've got to sign. Oh, you don't want the deal, doesn't matter. Someone else will. You can't put your music out without a label, but now you can. So now the labels are morphing into whatever they have to do to survive, but they don't want to. The reason major labels are always trying to buy Ditto isn't to further the cause of independent musicians, it's to get musicians like Stormzy when they first start out with one song out and sign them to a bad deal. That's the whole thing. It's not to kind of, for anything else, they don't want the money, they don't want anything. They just want to get them first so they can give them a worse deal than giving them what they have to give Stormzy when he goes in at the top and he gets a great deal. Okay, so I get it. So for me, just summarizing that part, when a, when a Stormzy comes to Ditto, they actually have an opportunity to build their value yeah. within the marketplace. But if there wasn't companies like yourself, they would, it would be the first entry point would be the labels and you'll just get the standard deal. Like, yeah. if it's not with us, you can't well, I mean, you, it, like I say, someone like Stormzy, and even a day, their head was so focused on knowing what they wanted. 
they took it right to the top point where they can get whatever deal they want and that would have been surely in, squarely in their interest. But what the majors would like is to pick that artist up at the beginning and take 91% of their, of their royalties. See, the model Ditto has now, same, the reason I've changed that is because I had all these artists coming through, selling loads of albums and they were just going to the major labels and a lot of them were coming back because they took the money and they'd had a bad experience because nothing happens because they, as we were saying before, it's just about market share for these guys because it's a corporate owned co company. You know, whoever, I run Ditto so I go home at night and care about what happens at Ditto. If I'm a boss at Warner Brothers, as much as I care about it, it's a job. You know, in 10 years I might be somewhere else, it doesn't really matter to me. For me, I have to build long term. A label person might be there 12 months. Yep. So their whole job is to get as much market share in, show their boss, survive another 12 months. That's it. So. The reason I've changed my model is because I want to, you know, I want to grow artists at Ditto. I want them to stay here and I don't want them to go and take those deals. I don't not like major labels because I have loads of friends that work there, but the, the difference between them and a company like mine is the bureaucracy of being able to make things happen. You know, mm. it's a lot slower, slower working there. Um, and so just to piggyback off that, I'm, I, hypothetically, a lot of your friends would probably like to do a lot more within the system. Exactly. Yeah. And when I went to Brazil, as I said, and got, um, Rodrigo over who was at Universal, he was really unhappy because like the stories is, you know, you sign an artist already knowing they're going to get dropped in six months at the party. You know, by the time <laughs> they come to the party and they get the cups out and everything. And he was saying in six months time, they had a guy who was in, who was paid just to walk down the reception, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. console them and get them out of the building because mm -hmm. that was just small wins, small wins, you know, nothing long term. Um, my model at Ditto now we take a percentage, we don't take any of the masters, it's a shorter term deal. And then we've opened a big building in London with a recording studio on, you know, and I want, I want to develop stuff and I want people to stay at Ditto for 10 years because there's nothing I don't have right now that a major label has. I have offices in 20 countries that have the same setup Ditto has here. If, you're, if you sign a deal in England, you're not going to have someone go and pitch you to Spotify in France. But I have people in France that I know will pitch your song, you know, from England and I have people in you know, Japan and Singapore and wherever else there is offices, we all work as a team. We all meet every week. We all talk about it to each other. We're, we're, like, we're a family. You know, my art is a family. You know, that's what I want. A ditto, some, something, you know, that's going to be here. So For, talking about the artist, like, um, like you said, you, you guys had Stormzy for a few years. He was yeah. working with you as well as Dave. Who are some of the other artists that you had work on, work with Ditto? AJ Tracy, who worked for a long time, right up to the last That's single. That's one of his, his favourite artists. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, great guy, great manager. Um, honestly, man, most people, you know, most that, most people who've had a hit album, I'd say was probably the first one through Ditto. D-Block Europe's first, the first album through Ditto with Young Bane. Young Bane was on Ditto originally. Um, but, you know, they eventually, at the time, you know, I didn't have the same resources I have now as well. And that's why I've spent so long kind of building stuff that I don't want to leave. Mm. But most people, especially in the urban industry, because like I said, three years ago, no one wanted to sign these artists. Mm -hmm. And we've been, you know, we've been, James, who, you know, was our MD and started the company at the same time we did. He's, he's, he's in Dave's camp now and we're still great friends, but he was always, you know, he was a massive fan of Grime from the beginning. And we were, and, you know, people like Logan Sammer and all those guys were there from the beginning pushing this stuff that no one was really listening to and then it blew up and then people still I don't think not grime is anyway in the <laughs> language you know what the difference <laughs> and now you know drills blowing up and then Afrobeat came in and stuff but it's like you can't just run a business chasing what was happening six months ago man you've got to kind of look long term so for me it's finding you know what the next new artist is is doing that's interesting so let me put it like this so let's say hypothetically um I won't use the word agenda, I'll say, I'll use business model. So there's a ditto business, business model, and then there's an archaic label model, right? So if we now move into a whole portion of the industry where we're talking about market share, um, how are you able to shape shift, as you said, to try and make sure that the artists actually stay with you guys, as opposed to like, I said the analogy before, because I hate Arsenal. <laughs> being, being, being a, he's Arsenal fan, but being, being a feeder club because it's like a lot of people have passed through the Ditto yeah, yeah, of course. and then they've been able to sign deals elsewhere but there's no, there's no, there's no like find this fee or anything that goes back to Ditto so as a, as a business model in that end, how does Ditto survive? Um, 
I mean, I could go and do those deals if I wanted to. You know, I could go and put half a million in to get a certain album, a hip hop album, but how does a label do those deals and survive? You tell me, how does a label sign something for a million pounds It's going to make half a million back? And how is that a good business decision? So if something, like, you know, when an artist comes to this high and a label's going to pay them back double what the label will make to lose money, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. And that's, and it, and that, but that's based on the fact that they're just willing to have market share. Market share and yeah. saying we've got so-and-so, but they're not making any money out of it. I have to make money each week, you know, because mm. we're still completely owned by myself and my brother. I mean, obviously, you know, we do make money. We've got loads of kind of different parts we make money in, but we do management now. We do, you know, I say we create content. We've got offices. We've got the number one song in Sweden this week that, you know, we're on a percentage with Einar. We signed him on a long-term deal because we, he's 16 and no one was looking at it at that time. So... If, if you think long term about any business, you can win. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go and get into the short term model of signing an album for something, some ridiculous money. But with that, I need to build Ditto to the same point that Warner have. I now firmly believe that I have because I have the same amount of staff they do in England. Plus, I have a worldwide outreach for them as well. So two years, three years ago, I'm, you know, I'm not going to complain if an artist left. I mean, I won't complain now, but I'd like them to, to know that having a small, amazing team is better than having a, a huge, bad team.